All right, so um, onward we go today. Um, today we're going to take AutoCAD drawings and bring them into Illustrator. Um, thank you for those of you that are here for waking up early on the Halloween hangover day, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, hopefully it was a candy hangover, not uh, another kind of hangover. Anyway, uh, hopefully you guys had fun too, because it, it is fun, and it's silly, and why not have fun while you do it? Anyway. Uh, we will continue on today uh, where we left off last class. I, I hope that by now you have all four of your elevation views done. If not, you're a little bit behind and it's time to start catching up um, because this is going to be uh, leading into your assignment, which is due fairly soon. Uh, it appears that the plotter in this room is still down. I've been requesting that it be fixed. So we're down to one plotter. So plan plenty of time to try to plot. Uh, when that happens. I'm happy to help you guys once you're done today, um, maybe maybe next week uh, when you're done, I can help walk you over. We can, we can walk through the printing process, et cetera, so you feel comfortable with it. But I do want to make sure that each and every one of you have the experience of plotting, or shall we say the pleasure of plotting and pulling your hair out while it doesn't work. Uh, but that's part of it, because you're going to have to do it over and over and over again as you move forward in your, your design careers. So um, we need to practice with it. So today, I think one of the, the best things about this class and teaching about this class is when we can weave programs together. And so we will, we will start doing a lot of weaving from here on out. And so today, we're going to take the stuff that you've done in AutoCAD, we're going to bring it into Illustrator and hopefully make it a little bit nicer, make it a little bit prettier, that sort of thing. Uh, which hopefully will, will improve your drawing. I'm going to show you a variety of techniques for doing that. It's important to note, though, that the techniques that I'm going to do today are more about presentation quality drawings and less about you know, working drawings, construction drawings, stuff that you do uh, and hand to a contractor to go build. This is about the presentation more than anything else. So it's more, more what you're going to be doing in school than what you're going to be doing in the office. But at the same time, it's, it's about making the drawings look nice. Um, so I have the same setup that I had last class at the end where I had my elevation views set up. Um, and I need to actually, I'm seeing that this view is, is off slightly. Let me move it over just a bit because it doesn't line up. There we go. And when I go to print this or when I go to plot it, remember it's going to make a PDF. The cool thing about Illustrator is we've been working with .ai files or Illustrator files, but Illustrator also opens PDFs. So we just have to tell it to open that particular file. So I'm going to go ahead and print this. And it's the DWG to PDF. I'll say OK. And I'm going to save it into today's folder. Maybe. There we go. By default, it opens up in um, your Acrobat reader. We don't need it in Acrobat. So we'll close that. I'm going to leave AutoCAD open in the background just in case. And I'm going to go in and actually open up Illustrator. Maybe. All right, once Illustrator's open, I can actually go to File and then Open, and I'm going to go find that PDF that I just saved. So let me get back in here to today's exercise. And like I said, I can open up that PDF file directly in Illustrator, which is great. The other thing that's important to note is that all of the lines that are here, if I get inside here, are actually live lines that were created by AutoCAD that I can then manipulate and work with. When these drawings come in, because of the viewports, each drawing actually has a box around it that match up with the viewports. That box is called a clipping mask. Uh, and so we may need to release those clipping masks, and I'll show you how to do that in just a second, to gain access. The other option, though, let me zoom in on the plan for just a second is that we can go in and we can double click. And if you keep working your way in, you'll eventually get to um, the object that you're working on. I'm going to back out of uh, layer isolation mode. And I'm going to take a look for a second at the layer stack. 
And so we have one layer. Notice that the layers didn't get preserved. That's the one downside of this conversion, is we get everything in one layer. But if we start to look at this, I have five clip groups, and each of those clip groups represents one of these drawings. So for example, the plan view is this clip group right here. Inside of that clip group are a bunch of individual lines. Lots and lots and lots and lots. I'm not even halfway through the scroll yet. Okay? So there's lots and lots of paths or lines that represent this. Um, it can get a bit daunting as we go through it. So first off, I'm going to release these clipping uh, paths just so we can organize a bit. I'm going to select the object. I'm going to right click on the object. And I can say release clipping mask. Relatively easy to do. And we can also see that in the layer stack now, that layer that was clip group or clip group 5 has just changed to a bunch of paths. Before I release the other drawings, though, sometimes it's helpful to make a uh, sublayer. Let's see if I can do that here. I'll just make another layer. I'm going to call this plan. And I'll take all of those objects. Well, they're already selected. Perfect. And I'm going to drag those up onto the plan layer. And then I can turn it off to confirm that it, it did, in fact, go on its own layer. So I'm just kind of organizing a little bit. We'll look at the first elevation over here. Let me scroll over here. Um, let me right click on it and say Release Clipping Mask. There it is. And this is going to be, uh, let me think here. Which elevation view is this? That's north. This is my east elevation. And we'll move those objects onto the east elevation layer. Continuing on, this is my north elevation. I'll right click and say Release Clipping Mask. I'll create a new layer. And we'll call this one my north elevation. And I'll move the objects onto the north elevation layer. This is my west elevation. I'll right click and say Release Clipping Mask. New layer. West elevation. I'll move all those objects onto the west elevation layer. And you can know where this is going. This is my south elevation. I'll right click and say um, Release Clipping Mask. And I can actually just rename layer 1 to be south if I can type. South elevation. So now I have my, my plan nicely organized into, into, um, into groups. I have those clipping masks are gone, so I don't have to worry about them anymore. And now I can start to actually adjust my drawing or make changes to my drawing. We already did a pretty good job with the line weights in AutoCAD. So things that were coming in seemed to come in the way that I wanted them to. This table, however, seems a little bit dark or a little bit heavy in comparison with the other line weights. So I can actually come in and select these objects. I can go up to my line weights here, and I could change the, the point weight. Remember, it's not in millimeters anymore. Now it's in points, so it's a little bit off. But I could actually drop that down. So maybe 0.2, for example. Well, maybe that's a little bit light. Let's try 0.4. Yeah, something like that seems about right. So the point is, I can go in and make adjustments to these various lines as necessary. If I wanted the walls, for example, uh, I could change the thickness of the walls. One of the tricks for selecting things is we can actually go to Select, Same, Stroke, Weight for the same thickness line. So all of the stroke weight. I selected one of the walls, and then I said select all, all of the same stroke weight, which is the walls, which would allow me to go in and say, you know what, I really want that to be a little bit thicker. I'll go up to 1.5, for example. So make sure you take advantage of that select by a particular category. So select by stroke weight, I can bump that up. If I thought the bathroom here was a little bit light, I could go select same stroke weight, and it's going to get my lighter lines in here. 
and I could bump that up. So it's at 0 point, so let's go maybe 0 0.2, for example. And so they're a little bit, little bit thicker. Um, again, it's, it's a matter of preference as, as to what feels right. These seem to show up a little bit better at 0.48. Uh, so maybe these really need to do that. So let me go in and select same stroke weight. And we'll go up to maybe 0.4. Okay, so just subtle adjustments if they're necessary. You may or may not need to do that, but I wanted to point out that you can do that after the fact. So let me zoom out a little bit. I'll do control minus. And again, I'm going to concentrate for right now just on the plan. This little corner up here is really awkward. Um, the, the contour is a little awkward, so I'm just going to delete that. I don't really need it. Uh, likewise, I noticed that this line here isn't the same as this line. Unfortunately, there's no way of converting the line type. I'd have to go back and bring it in again. So I'm just going to leave it for right now. Um, OK, so let me continue on. Maybe, for example, I want to fill in the walls with a particular color. Now, we did this with a, with a hatch in AutoCAD, but maybe I want to do it after the fact in Illustrator. You can do it either way. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing here. The advantage of doing this in Illustrator is we have a little bit more flexibility about what the fill is. As opposed to just black or just a particular color, we can actually put some, some uh, variation on it. So before I do that, though, it's always a good idea to duplicate my layer. So I'm going to work with the plan on this particular example. So I'll go to my little flyout menu, and I'll say Duplicate Plan. It gives me Plan Copy. I'm going to work just in the plan copy. I'll turn everything else off so that I'm not confused. And I could even rename this to be Live Paint one, for example, just so that I'm not confused. Or live paint, maybe it's live paint dash plan. Whatever seems logical to you. OK, so then I will select all of the objects right there. And I'll come over to my live paint group. And I know we did this a little bit in the um, diagrams lecture. So this isn't, this isn't brand new for you. I'll come over, um, excuse me, I'll go up to object. Live Paint Make. That makes my Live Paint group. It changes the little cursors around this group of objects. And then I'll come over to my Live Paint Brush, which is hidden underneath the Shape Builder tool. It's in the Live Paint bucket right there. You can also press K to get to it quickly. And now I can actually choose a particular color. And I'm going to choose a fill color, not a stroke color. And maybe I'll pick a gray value. I could also specify a neutral gray, so I could say 0, 0, 0, and then a specific value, 50% gray, for example. I'll say OK. And then I'm going to come in, and as I zoom in, I can actually just fill in these regions. And it goes pretty fast. Couple more here. Like that. So those now are all, all my walls are filled in. And if I were to zoom out, you can see that I can see the walls a little bit better. This isn't really any different than doing a, a hatch command, though, in AutoCAD. So let's see if we could take it a step further on this. I'm going to continue with the live paint bucket here. But this time, instead of picking a gray, I'm actually going to pick a color just so that I can quickly see what it is that I'm filling in. So in this case, I'm going to fill in the floor. So we'll fill that in. Oops, didn't like my color. Uh, it's probably because my colors are in gray. Let me switch to RGB there. And then let me just paint over it again. There we go. Let me fill in a little bit more there, 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 and there, for example. So there's all my floor or my interior floor. Once that's done, maybe I also want to fill in um, something else. So we'll do this outside space, but I'll color that in in a slightly different color. I'm generally a fan of picking random colors because I can use the select tool to choose how I'm selecting the various regions. Looks like I probably should have done the uh, 
closets there. There we go. So I have those done. When I'm done, I'm going to come up to, at least I thought I was. Yeah, I'm going to come up to this Expand button. And I had to actually select it with the black arrow here. When I click on Expand, I now have access with the white arrow, or the Direct Select, to select the individual pieces that I just painted. So I'm going to ignore the grays for just a second, and I'm going to select all the blues. So let me go to um, Select Same Fill Color, for example. And now I have all of those pieces filled in. Okay? I can take those and I can make them one object by going to Object, Compound Path, Make. So they're all now one object. And I can take this a step further and apply like a background texture on this. And there's two different ways of doing this. I could start with just a, a plain, easy swatch. There are swatches on the course website. If you go to swatches here, I told you I had a bunch of the, these Prismacolor ones. I mentioned this before. If you want to make it match up with uh, the Prismacolor color markers, you can do it that way. Um, you can use the grays, you could use the architectural color set. All of these are available for download. Uh, the architectural set, for example, uh, it's a 43 meg file, so it's going to take a little bit of time to come down. Let me download the uh, warm gray set. Should take a little bit less time to come down. Truth is, I probably already have these on my flash drive. Let's see if I have them on my flash drive. I'm going to go over to my swatches. I'm going to click the little flyout menu, and I'm going to say Open Swatch Library, Other Library. And let's see if I have it already. Yeah, there's my warm grays, for example. Let me, let me load the architectural ones. Uh, and there's the, there they are. And so I can then, with this object that I just created, I could apply one of these marker colors to it, which gives it a faint bit of color. The advantage of these, let me pick uh, the black just so you can see, is they have little marker lines in them. So it looks like you went in and hand colored it, which is the, the, the idea. So I could apply, say, maybe this gray to it. It's a little too close to the walls. I could come in. And I could select those walls. Again, let me select same uh, fill color to get all of the walls. And then I could apply, for example, the black marker on that. Control minus zooms out. And you can see that I'm starting to layer up uh, the complexity of this drawing just a bit. The outside space here, actually, let me, before I, before I move on, I'm going to go to uh, Compound Path Make to make all of those fills the same, the same object as well. Uh, let me use this outside, and maybe the outside, I'm going to do a slightly different tone, maybe something like that, to distinguish that it's outside versus inside, something along those lines. When we start getting into doing these floor plans and that sort of thing, it's really a matter of personal preference. You have to start to decide what looks right to you and what doesn't look right. And I'm going to show you, keep showing you strategies. And just because I say, oh, do this and do this and do this, doesn't mean that in your final drawing you need to have all of these. They're just different strategies uh, and ways of showing it. So for example, you might find that, I, you know what, I really don't like the black walls. They're too strong, so you take them out. Maybe you take those black walls and you adjust the transparency value of those walls. So here it is under opacity, and you say, you know what, let me, let me drop them down. Oops. Sorry, I was on a line, not my wall. There we go. And you drop that down a little bit. Maybe that's not enough. Yeah, maybe that's the right value. So you have to play around with what, what is really the right thing. The other thing that we can do is we can apply kind of a dirt texture, because drawings often look really sharp and clean. And sometimes just a little bit of dirt can go a long way uh, in terms of softening up the look uh, and can be, can be artistic. So to do that, I'm going to, and I already saved a bunch of these. If you do an image search, 
or Creative Commons, I should do it that way. And uh, I'll search Flickr for grunge texture. What a grunge texture is, is it something that somebody has photographed. It could be a piece of paper. It could be a dirty wall. Uh, it could be a variety of things that just have a little dirt on them, something like that. Sometimes they're a little bit overdone, like this one is a little bit over uh, processed. But it can still look really nice behind a particular image. So you can download one of these files. So there's my version. Um, I have a bunch of stuff on my flash drive. Let's try that one more time here. Copy it. In my resources folder, I have a folder called grunge textures. And this is where a bunch of these kinds of textures live. Um, ones that I found in the past that I like. There's the one from today that I just got. And I'm going to go back to Illustrator. I'm going to select all of the floor. I'm going to do this on the floor because I think it'll be more obvious on the floor than it is on the wall. And I'm going to apply this grunge texture to this particular um, object. And when I do this, by the way, if you get lost in the steps, Illustrator 3.10 walks through this exact thing and how to do it. Uh, so you can go back and reference that. But essentially, what I'm going to do is with the object selected, I'm going to open the transparency menu or the transparency window. If you don't see the transparency window, you can go to Window and then check the box for transparency, and it'll show up. And on the transparency window, if for some reason you get just a tiny little box like this, click the Flyout menu and say Show Thumbnails so you can get a little bit more information. With that selected, I'm going to click on the Make Mask button right here. And so this is a little bit like Photoshop, where we're now creating a mask on uh, the object that we had. And with the mask selected, so notice I had the little orange border around my object. When I switch and click on the mask here, I can then go to File and Place and drop in that grunge texture. So let me go back to. Um, my resources and my grunge textures. Where's the one that I downloaded today? There it is. There's the one from today. I can place that in. I might have to make it a little bit bigger. I'll use the, um, the free transform tool. I'm going to hold down Shift to keep it in proportion, though it doesn't really matter whether it's in proportion or, or not. It's just a background grunge texture. And you can see that instead of having a, a stark feel to it, just a color range, you can see that it has a bunch of little white dots and a little bit of custom texture to it. Does that make sense? So it can really enhance your drawings. It is a subtle thing. You have to figure out what the right balance of this is. You don't want your drawing to look too dirty, but a little bit always helps. So in this case, maybe it's still a little bit strong. It looks better on the projector than it does on my screen here. Uh, but I still might need to go back and, and edit, edit the transparency of this a little bit more. Um, I can do that here. I could drop it down a little bit. Actually, you know what? Let me go. Let me leave this at 100. And I'm actually going to switch back over to the object itself. So I'm going to switch back over to the object, and then I'll adjust the transparency, maybe like that. Oh, you guys can't see it anymore, but it looks a lot better for me. So we'll just we'll pretend that it, it looks good for me like it does on the, on the projector. But the point is that something like this can really enhance your drawing a bit. Okay? So I've done that to this particular piece. If you get locked in to, oh, I can't seem to access my object anymore, it's because you're still in the mask. You've got to make sure you click out. Just like in Photoshop, you had to click back over. Um, you want to click out of the mask itself. You do have the ability to invert the mask if you didn't like the way the texture was applying. And you can see that it's the opposite texture. Um, so just be aware that that exists should you want to make that modification. OK, so I've now finished, for now, the plan. And we'll call that quits. I'm going to move on to one of the elevation views. So let me turn on. I want to do the east elevation. This one has more windows, so I'll do this one. Okay, so this is my north elevation. 
I'm going to right click, or excuse me, I'm going to go to the little fly out menu and say duplicate north elevation. Again, I want this as a copy so that I can work on the copy in case I make a mistake. It's always a good idea to make the copy and work on the copy, just in case. So now I'm going to go back through and do the same live paint. So I'll select the whole object. There it is. I'll go to Object, Live Paint, Make. And I'll go to the Live Paint Bucket tool. And I'm going to fill in a couple different things on my shape here. First thing I'm going to do is fill in where the windows are. So let me make kind of a bluish color for the windows. And I'll fill this in. So there's window, window, window. So now I have the windows filled in. The uh, walls I'll fill in in a different color. And I'm not overly worried about the color of the walls that I'm picking here. I just want some obvious, obvious color. And then the last thing would be the wood of the windows. And this is going to take a little bit longer. I'll probably have to zoom in just a bit. So bear with me for a second. This could be the metal of the windows, too. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to, sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, and then hold on a second. I've got a little bit more wall to do. Let me match this color. Nope, that was not what I wanted to do. Well, I'll just change to uh, another color. And fill those two pieces in. Perfect. So when I'm all done, I'm going to click the Expand button. And that breaks apart the object. Then I can use my white arrow or my direct select tool to select, for example, all of the windows. So I'll select this one window here. And then I'll go up to the Select menu and select same fill color. And that will give me all of the windows together. So I'm actually, for clarity purposes, going to bring these objects onto their own Windows layer. So let me create another layer here. I'll move those objects, and I'm going to call this Windows North Elevation. And then I could turn off everything but the windows. So now I have just the windows showing. So if I'm thinking about these windows in the context of just the North Elevation, something like that, the blue is a little bit strong against the line drawing. I think we can agree to that. Now, if I were to take all of the windows, so I'll do the same thing, select same fill color there. I could adjust the color value here and drop it much lighter. So it's kind of a late, faint blue. Okay, And that by itself, eh, that looks a little bit better. I get a sense that there's glass there. But I could also do something a little bit more to this. So once again, I'll select it. I'll go to select same fill color. And instead of using <coughs> a grunge texture, this time, I'm actually going to place in a little bit of sky to represent where these windows are. So let me go find a picture of clouds. So I'll go back to my Creative Commons search. And I'll search for cloudy sky. So maybe something like this is kind of nice, these wisps. I'll go ahead and download this in its original size here. Show it in its folder. I'm going to copy this. I'll go to Resources. Um, and I actually have a folder called Background Images and a folder called Skies, because I do this. I'm going to go ahead and, and paste this in here. Uh, this would be in a cloudy sky. There we go. You can see I have a bunch of different ones. I'll go to Paste. There's another option. Now I'll go back to Illustrator. And I need all of these objects to be one path. 
So right now, there are a bunch of individual paths. So with all of them selected, I'll go up to Object, Compound Path, Make, and I get one compound path. This is important to, to dissect this as part of the layer structure. So I have my main layer, and I have a compound path. On the same main layer here, I'm going to place, I'll go to File, and then Place, my Sky Texture. So I'll go back to Background Images. I'll go into My Skies. And I'll pick my background image. There it is. I may need to adjust the scale of this just a bit. We can make this uh, get smaller, Maybe a little bit bigger, something like that. OK, so now I have, the, the, I have the cloudy sky. I need to make sure that my path is on top of my image. And again, I can make some adjustments. I could adjust the image placement, you know, maybe about like that. So again, path on top of image, when it's set up exactly this way, if it's not precisely this way, it's not going to work. And this is the one sticky thing that people run into. So just you have to make sure it's your, your, your layer, compound path, image. If it's in that sense, I'll select the main layer itself, come up to my flyout when menu, and say, make clipping mask. And when I do that, it's going to clip the image to all of the little shapes that I had cut out, which is really convenient because now I can see just the sky. Now, this is still probably a little bit strong. So I can actually take that and drop the opacity down just a little bit. So we'll go maybe to 60%. Now, you guys can't see it as well. Um, go a little bit higher for you. I'll do 80% so you can see it. And that's very different than just the stark blue color for the glass. So I have something like this. This may be enough. So I just have a little bit of, of color on the elevation. Maybe I want to take it a step further. Maybe I want to do uh, have all of the concrete have a texture to it. I could do the same thing again. I'll come back. There's my windows. I'll turn them off for right now. I'll turn on my north elevation copy. There it is. Let me select all of the pieces that would be the concrete. So it's this green color. I'll go to select, same fill color. Plus, I will select these two pieces because I forgot them there and there. With all of those selected, I'm going to go ahead. Let me turn off. There we go. With all of those selected, I'm going to create a brand new layer. And I'll call this concrete. North elevation. I'll move those objects onto the concrete north elevation. There they are. I'll go up to Object, Compound Path, Make. They're all one object now, which is what I wanted. And now, in the same sense here, I have my concrete, I have my compound path, I just need the background wall. So I'm going to go back to my Creative Commons search here. And I'll say concrete wall. None of those are particularly wonderful so far. This one's OK, except for the windows. This lower part is not too bad. Um, you could also type in concrete wall tiling texture. Remember, we made these a while back. I'll try these concrete blocks. Not the most attractive thing in the world, but you get, you'll get the sense. Let me go ahead and download this. And I'm going to copy this one into today's folder. Um, there we go. And now I'll go in and I'll go to File and then Place. And I'm going to find that texture. Go 
it is. Ooh. Yeah, it looks like I had some from last semester. That, were, that one's much more attractive. But anyway, I'll do this one and place it in. Uh, it's way too big for scale. It's not going to look right. So I'm going to scale this down. I'll use the free transform tool here, and I'll scale this down so that the size of these blocks seems about right for the building. Okay, So something like that. Now, I s this obviously isn't enough to cover up all of the, the building here. So I'm actually going to copy and paste this many times. But before I do that, I want to make sure that my path is on top of my image file. So I'm in the correct order. But then I'll go ahead and copy and paste. So I'll go to the black arrow. I have my object selected. Control C to copy, Control V to paste. And these should jump together rather nicely. If it's a tiling texture, these should connect together. I'm going to copy all three at once. Come on. There it is. And take all of them. Control C, Control V. I'm just trying to save myself a little time. We'll do one more patch right there. Perfect. Now, my layer structure is off again, so I need this compound path to end up on top of all the rest of the stuff. There it is. So unlike last time, I have lots of image files, but I still only have one compound path. That's important. I can go back to the main layer itself. I can come up to my flyout menu, and I can say, make clipping mask. And it will then clip all of those objects in the same shape here. This is uh, definitely too strong in its, in its color. So I really need to, to drop that uh, opacity down. So let me select the object. And I'll come up to my opacity. And we'll drop it down. Oops. Yeah, maybe something like that. So it's not nearly as strong there. Now when I come back to actually uh, install these on my elevation, it's probably helpful to put my elevation lines on top of both the concrete and the window so that they're in front of the other two things. Okay? Let me turn on the windows, for example, so you can see those. Something like that. So this is a very different look than just a black and white elevation. There's nothing wrong with a black and white elevation. There's nothing wrong with applying, just like I did in the plan view, some grunge textures to this. So it's all just black and white with a little grunge texture. Instead of putting the sky in, you could do a black and white grunge texture on the glass. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in what you end up deciding to do. Uh, and just because I say, oh, put this in and do this, remember, you're editing. You're deciding what's the right look for your particular work. So now I've done the plan. I've done one elevation. I'm not going to do all the elevations, but I will turn them back on and make a few other notes about uh, the, the views here. Did I lose? There we go. There's my south ele elevation. I'm going to look at the south elevation for a second. And I want to talk about the ground plane and how we identify the ground plane. And so in this particular view, we already said that the, the ground line should be the thickest line of all of it. And so I could actually increase the thickness of this if I wanted to go into my stroke. And we could say, you know what, let's make that a two-point line or even a three-point line just so that it has a little bit more weight. And you guys can see that that immediately gives it a little bit more weight. It gives it a little bit more feeling for ground. Sometimes people like to fill in underneath the, the piece of, uh, of ground with a color or with black or something like that. Black is pretty easy. Um, but I'll do, I'll do a variety of strategies for you in just a second. I'm going to not connect to my existing line. I'm going to go right next to it. I'll come down. I'll go over. And I'll come back up so that I'm close. And then I'll go in and I'll actually make some modifications. So there and there, we'll move them over so that they end up right there. That one needs to go up a little bit more. The reason I didn't connect these to my existing line 
is because I want control over what's happening below uh, separate from this. And actually, probably the best strategy would have been to just duplicate that line. So let me do it that way. Sorry, sometimes I change my mind as we go along. Let me take this line. I'm going to edit, copy, and edit, paste in place, which means it's going to be in the exact same place. Then I'll use my pen tool and keep drawing from that point. I'll draw down and over. and back up. So now I have this object. I could flip it and fill it in in black. And we could see I have a little bit of a piece that's hanging out there. But anyway, we could see it as a black object. Now this feels really heavy. So probably a bit much. So maybe I take this and I apply a light gray to it. Oops. Helps if you select your object first. Okay, that then doesn't feel quite so bad. When you're doing a fill, it works best if it's at the bottom of a page so that you can kind of bleed the color all the way off the page. If I did this same treatment to this elevation, let me go ahead and do it really fast. Come on. There we go. trying to be neutral so they're both in gray. See how this puts a bunch of weight right above? It's like this, this ground is floating above this elevation and it makes it feel squashed. It doesn't work nearly as well. So if you have elevations that are floating, it's best to keep that uh, not with a big color block underneath it. Uh, leave it just as the simple line because we don't feel the same weight. Back it up one more. So leave it just like that. But if you're down at the bottom of the page putting something in like this, it's not a bad strategy. Sometimes we actually want to put some text in. So on something that's clean, like one of these lines, and sorry, I have to turn off the, uh, the pink doors. It's bothering me. Um, we might just put in some text. So remember about typography and font choice and that sort of thing. And so this is the south elevation. So maybe I'm going to come in here with some text and we'll say south. Something like that. Remember, this is going to print out at 24 by 36. So your font choices are similar to what you're going to be reading. Okay, the, you, you read an English paper, it's at 12 point. Maybe you want it to be a little bit bigger. Uh, okay, I'll bump this up to 16 or 18 point. So maybe I'll go to 18 point. Oops. For example, let me zoom out a little bit. It's still rather small. All too often, and this I promise you, you will lose points on if you do this. All too often, people say, oh, I need, to, I need to make sure that people understand that this is the south elevation. And they put this giant text in. Because on the computer screen, that looks reasonable. Because I'm looking at it from far away. But if I print this out, these letters are huge. right? And you can even look at the back. A lot of people have put larger text. And I'm picking on those posters for, for right now. But the text, when you put it in too big, it draws all of your attention. And it ends up being really, really ugly. Okay? So limit your font size to maybe 16 or 18 point max when you're doing these kinds of things. Be tasteful with where you place it. So maybe it's 18 point. Think about, oops. Oh, come on. I should have put it on its own layer because it's not letting me. Right. You should. There it is. And I put it on top of all the rest of the layers so it'll automatically show up. And you want to think about where it's placed, what feels right. So that it's not overpowering and it's in the corner. Sometimes you want to put a little bit of extra text below it, like the scale of your drawing. So maybe I'll come in here and I'll put another little bit of text. This is a quarter inch equals one foot. 
that's too big, so I'll select that and we'll go in a hierarchy down so that's a little bit smaller. Maybe this is 10 point, for example. Let me take both of these and I'm going to change the alignment. And then I'll take both of them and I'll use the align tools. Let me go to window, align, and I'll align to the right so that they're even. And now I have a little scale indicator. Maybe I want to have a little line between these. Like that, for example. Right? Subtle, not too much. There is one case where large text can work. And that works if you're doing it as part of a color block. So I could do it, and I could say south south elevation. Let me br bring this up. I'm going to pick on 48 point for just a second. Oops. I'm going to change my color. Sorry, that should be to be just white. And I'll move it in as part of the text below. This could even be brought up a little bit bigger. And again, this is a style thing. It's up to you. Uh, let's say too big. No, way too big. Where it becomes part of the ground, something like that. And I'm very careful with the placement so that it overlaps, so that it can be part of the text. This is more of a graphic element than just text. Does that make sense? So you can do something like this, and it can work, but you just have to be real careful because you don't want the text to overpower the drawing. And in this, in this particular case, it probably is overpowering the drawing. This gray probably needs to be a lot lighter. Maybe something like that. And you see now that I made it lighter, it's, the text doesn't stand out. It doesn't leap out nearly as much as it did. Does that make sense? So it's all about kind of working through the strategies. Um, stick with basic fonts when possible. Um, there's a font that I use. On, on real architectural drawings uh, called Frank the Architect, which I think is a really good architectural font. It's much better than anything that's in any of the computers. Um, the basic version of it is free, and you can download it. If you Google it, uh, you'll find it. It was developed by uh, a designer who just wanted a good architectural font. Um, There it is. And so you can see it looks like your, your kind of classic um, architectural font. It's great, um, but you don't. The, the good news is you don't have to buy the full version of it, but it doesn't have all the characters, but it'll get you by um, just fine. Uh, so that's available to you if you want to. In school, a lot of times you're best off just keeping with a simple uh, sans serif font. Nothing, nothing particularly fancy. Make sure it's sans serif. Um, <clears throat> And um, you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, some sometimes you're going to want to actually put a graphic bar scale in, which is an option. Uh, I've emphasized that more in the past. I think if you write the scale, uh, it's perfectly fine. The, the reason that graphic bar scales have uh, value is that if your drawing gets printed at the wrong scale, somebody could still measure it um, based on that particular size. There are some uh, goodies so to speak, on the course website. If you go to, I think it's under downloadable resource packages. There's Frank the Architect. Title blocks, right? I have a zip file that has some stuff like title blocks and whatever in it. Um, the truth is, I'm not really in love with these. So if you choose not to use them, I'm OK with it. But I do want to download it and at least show you the, uh, the graphic bar scale, if it'll finish. Once it's downloaded, remember you have to extract it because it's a zip file. There it 
There it is. There's a folder called Illustrator. And then there's a bunch of scales. We can drop those directly into your, your drawing here. If I go to File and then Place, uh, where did I have that? It was in the Downloads folder, wasn't it? I'm going to do the quarter inch scale here. You can see there's, there's a couple different styles. I like this one. Place it in. So there's your graphic bar scale that gives you what the scale would be. It's just a matter of placing this into your drawing somewhere. Maybe that one's a little bit large. Probably needs to go over in this direction. I could adjust the font size if the font size seemed too large. There's also a couple other styles. The casual one, here's a quarter, quarter inch equals a foot. It was used, Frank the Architect was the font, so that's why we're not seeing anything. How nice. Well, that one failed miserably. Um, anyway, <laughs> don't use that one, right? There are also some title blocks that are in here. Um, here's your 24 by 36. Let me. And it looks like it conveniently didn't load anything either. So we'll just pretend that that was not something I showed you. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you could, of course, draw in your own title block if you wanted a title block. Uh, by title block, I'm essentially meaning something that goes around your drawing. It's usually a little bit thicker. Hold on a second. There we go. I think I was putting it in on the wrong layer. Um, so there's a title block that's going around your drawing. Um, we could add a little bit in the corner here. Essentially, we could put in Yosemite Cabin, the scale, or, or whatever. If you're struggling with what a title block looks like, you can, of course, do a Google search. Um, and you can get a sense for, for the kinds of title blocks that are out there. The truth about the title block, in all honesty, I think they're, they're relevant when you're working in a firm. It's very rare that you're going to print out some kind of a design piece for presentation and have a title block around it. It just tends not to happen. We tend to show it as a big board more than anything else. And so um, in terms of, of you guys getting ready for your assignment, if you don't end up having a title block around it, you're not going to get graded down because you didn't put a title block around it um, as you're going toward assignment 205. Uh, but how you pr choose to present the drawings is, is obviously more relevant. So, I know I've thrown a lot of different things at you, um, different strategies, different styles, et cetera. Today's your experimentation day. So it doesn't matter how it turns out or if it's really ugly. Play around with all of these and see, do I like it? Do I not like it? Is it working? Is it not working? Can I do a grunge texture? Can I do uh, uh, you know, one of the clipping masks with the clouds or whatever? Then when you do your assignment, do a fresh start and say, what looks best? What to my eye feels good? Is it subtle enough? Am I showing off the architecture enough? Is the, is the textures and stuff that I've done distracting to the drawings? Those are the questions you want to ask when it comes to the assignment. But for right now, play around with all of it, and it can end up being ugly. That's OK. Any questions? No? All right. 